Welcome to our 28th podcast. Today we'll be talking about building a culture of change. What's the one thing you can do to build a culture that is comfortable with change? Keep listening to find out. Welcome to Harmonious Workplaces, a podcast about corporate culture, organizational change management, and workplace behavior. Harmonious Workplaces was started by independent consultants Rich Cruz, Ben Kleinman, and Cheryl Volpe to explore, challenge, and build on various organizational culture and change management concepts. It's a blend of theory and practice based on their personal and professional experiences working with companies of all sizes across various industries. If you own a business, lead a team, want new ideas about the corporate environment, or just want to listen to a group of consultants talking about how to make work more enjoyable, we invite you to sit back, relax, and dive in with us to Harmonious Workplaces. Hello there, Harmonious Workplaces listeners. Uh, Thanks for joining us. My name is Rich Cruz. I'm an organizational development consultant, and I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Ben Kleinman. Hey, Ben. Hey, everyone. And Ben is an organizational change management consultant, and by Cheryl Volpe. Hey, Cheryl. Hi, everyone. And Cheryl is an industrial organizational psychology consultant, and together we're bringing you the Harmonious Workplaces podcast, and We are going to continue our discussion on change and culture, and today is really about building a culture that somewhat embraces change, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We had had tried to be snazzy with our title and call it a culture of change, and so maybe before we get too far down the road, we should define what we mean by that, or at least give some guardrails on that. So when we were prepping for our conversation today, one of the things that kept coming coming up as we were talking about it, each each one of us was speaking to some level of being comfortable with ambiguity. Cheryl, those were some words you used, comfort with ambiguity, mm-hmm. or cultivating a culture where change is welcome, mm-hmm. where change is part of that culture. Rich, you had referenced some work that you've done with Six Sigma and having the flexibility to essentially adapt to changes across a variety of environments. And, um, you know, if you want, we're, we're just getting started. So if you want to throw our first acronym in there, uh, you could, you could certainly do that now. That I would will. Work. I will. <laughs> it'll, it'll, it all in due time. In, in due, due time. time. Okay. All right. So, uh, stay tuned for Rich's first acronym drop of the episode. And so I think where, where all that leaves us is, um, this idea that, there's so much change going on and we have some great stats that, that will bring there. There really just needs to be a sense within cultures, organizational cultures now that you can't just have a, a sense of stasis or a sense that everything is going to be stable. And that's the way it's going to be for the next 20 odd years. There has to be some sense that there will be change, that changes is welcome, that change is a good thing and that change doesn't have to be scary or it doesn't have to be overly complicated. It's just more of a evolutionary part of the workforce as opposed to um, more out of the out of the ordinary. So let me pause. Sure. Does, does that seem like it resonates with you both? And um, does that kind of c- capture the definition or the, the, the shape of what we mean by culture of change? I do think that you got that exactly right. And the uh, learning culture is another way that people often. Oh, yeah, I like that. This. Yeah, a learning culture. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Cool. We're not, uh, if we're not learning, we're not growing. If we're, if we're not growing, we're staying stagnant. And is that, you know, is that where the organization wants to be? Right. 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 And, and most of the organizations that I've worked with um, don't do well when they stay stagnant for too long. There, there's right. there's a pretty good sense of urgency across that leadership tier that recognizes that the industry is moving. Their company needs to be proactive about that as opposed to reactive. Um, okay. For sure. I, I promised you all some statistics and oh, yeah. you can Bring them on. take them for what they're worth. And um, we can all go back to our favorite Mark quote that was attributed to Mark Twain. But in that sense, um, we Cheryl had shared a lovely sort of summary of a survey that a consulting house, KPMG, did 
about employee behavior and um, some of the statistics that they shared in that were pretty striking. And I'm sure these resonate across other surveys that you two have seen and, and maybe others in the, in the world that are listening have seen. One thing that's really stood out to me is that about three quarters of the employees that they surveyed are involved in three or more transformation work streams at any given time. So think about that. You've got your day job. And then you've got essentially three additional mini jobs on top of that, that are yeah. all related to some sort of transformation initiative. That's bonkers. That's just that's bonkers. A lot. That's a lot. You know, one is, yeah. one is probably normal and should be state. Maybe best practice is to always have one kind of stream going, but three that's that's it's unimaginable to see how you would be able to get any work done and run three change programs and have any stability in all of that that that, that struck me really really um profoundly the other one that, sure. that struck me and so there's two more i want to share the, the other one that struck me was that over half of the managers they surveyed said that there was too much change underway so you had three quarters of the employees on three or more work streams, over 50% of the managers, over half mm -hmm. of the managers saying there's too much change going on. So that really, really tells you that of the organizations that were surveyed, there's a sense from the workforce writ large that there's just too much change going on. And then the last one, which maybe you two as org development folks can speak to and HR folks can speak to a little bit more, two thirds of the employees who work an additional six to 10 hours. So I'm assuming that the surveyors mean that these are six to 10 hours that are additionally needed per week to do all of this extra change stuff. So you have employees working their regular work week, and then they have all this extra work they need to do six to 10 hours. Those employees, two thirds of those employees report having high stress, which we've already talked about in prior episodes. It's just a really bad thing. Right. Let me pause. What what reactions do you all have um, with some of those stats that they threw out? There was another stat that you said in there um, earlier uh, that not not that you didn't just say, but um, so somewhere something about tech changes. Yeah, something like so. So, the, so the, right, exactly, Rich. So two thirds of middle managers. So not the top CEO level, not the worker B level, but the middle manager level, two thirds of those have experienced a major tech transformation in the last two years. That sure. actually strikes me as low. I feel like most companies that I've worked with are doing some kind of major tech transformation much more frequently than every two years. Right. But let's, like just always, say, right? let's just say that it's two years. That's a, that's a huge, like imagine every two years, you're jettisoning your customer relationship management system, or you're chucking out your sales system, or you're completely destroying the database that has all of your corporate data and how you interact with that and search data, and you're building a new one for that. Wow. Oh, I can I imagine that? I've, I've been there. <laughs> Do I this is... This is almost why most of these contracts are like three-year contracts because they're like, okay, we got it for three years. What's going to happen after that third year? You know, are they going to are they going to forget to roll over, or are they going to want to you know six months before? Are they going to want to you know change again? And be, you know, find something else. You know, and yeah, I hadn't even thought about that. Really but right. imagine, yeah. imagine just staying with the same system. So most businesses that I've worked with, Microsoft is the operating system of choice. Microsoft has the business tools. Uh, the, all Now Microsoft is rolling out Copilot. That's essentially a huge tech transformation, even though it's within the same ecosystem. Same with Salesforce. Salesforce has been in most companies I've worked with. They're rolling out their version of an AI Copilot. It's essentially a new Salesforce. So, yeah. wow. Yeah. Right, and, and think about the training alone, right? And that documentation and all the things that we've said in the past about, on other episodes about, you know, different learners, different uh, repetition of the same message in different ways, you know, that, that alone. And that takes time to plan. And yeah. you, know, you know when that time was not invested. 
as an employee, you know, pretty much right away. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. Well, are we ready for the first acronym drop of the day? Because this is something that I've talked to my, uh, my students at, uh, at the college I teach at, um, you know, to be prepared for PESTL, political, economical, social, technology, environmental, and legal things that could change within the open systems that we live in, right? So we, we live in a, a, a business environment that is now, you know, it's not just local and national, but global. And we have all of these, all of these other things that happen that, in fact, I think this was like way early in our, in our conversations, right? Where we talked about all the reasons for change, right? Um, But that's always going to, that's always going to be present. So as much as we have a culture that we want to have everybody aligned to the, you know, the way we do things here, right? (laughs) Uh, we still have to be able to help people to navigate those changes because that's gonna that's just something that's gonna happen. To to uh, what you said there, Ben, about uh, um, Salesforce and, and Microsoft, right? Almost every software has an update that happens uh, at least annually, maybe semi-annually, mm-hmm. maybe quarterly, um, and that's going to affect how people have to deal with it all the way through the organization sometimes maybe not always but sometimes um so and to what you were saying there cheryl about like you have to go back and like almost retrain people and there's that that kind of change burnout that can happen but you know i think uh having part of the 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 culture being able to understand that this is going to happen and we need to do that, so we need to build that into into the way we do things. Right, right. And rapid change at that pace can almost seem reckless, right? And that's where you can lose your people, right? If we have to pivot yet again, what was the planning with the previous one? Was this a mistake? And that's when people start to question back channel, and that can lead to a, you know, unhealthy corporate culture there. So leaders have a huge job to do when they are expecting their their people to keep up with this pace, right? They've got to keep the whys in there. They've got to, you know, use their pestle and keep those values in mind and keep them clear. Communication. Right. Yep. Commute. The big C. Yeah. Which means lots of different things. Maybe don't use that. <laughs> cool. Um. Well, with that, let's take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this uh, you know, this concept of a- for Fortune 100 companies and small businesses alike. Harborside Strategy helps design and implement customized precision change management initiatives, from new organizational structures to new processes to new systems. We help you clarify the reason and urgency around your change in language that will resonate across your organization. With that clarity and a common purpose, we use the power of stories and blended communication methods to reinforce your goals and keep everyone focused and aligned. All of it tailored to your people, your organization, your needs. Contact Principal Ben Kleinman today to learn more at www.harborsidestrategy.com. Again, that is www.harborsidestrategy.com. And we're back. So we're talking about a culture of change. Um, And that's, you know, kind of a culture that, well, why don't we do this? Let's let's redefine because we've done this before, but it just makes sense to do this again. Let's redefine what culture means to us, if that's fair to do. Yeah, I think last time we had a couple of really good definitions. The one that's um, really been resonant for me the last 
recent amount of time is this idea that you have culture being a, a combination of your values and your behaviors, your values and actions. And so it's kind of sure. like you were saying before, the way we do things around here, and that's infused with the corporate values. Yeah. Right. And for me, it's that, that interstitium, that uh, space between all of our internal organs that keep everything together inside. It's the culture in a company plays a very similar role in that these are the things that whether they are spoken or unspoken, the expectations for behavior based around the mission and the values. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, if I can bring back the shine model of, uh, you know, the, the, the proverbial uh, uh, iceberg, right? Mm. There's the underlying assumptions. Then there's the values uh, that stem from that. And those are the things that are under the water, right? Those are the things that we kind of feel and think and are within the organization. And then there's the artifacts, the behaviors, the outward signs and symbols. And so it's it's the behaviors, but it's also you know the slogans and the things that that uh, you know the signage and and everything else that tells everybody this is who we are and this is what we do and how we do it. Um, I would just like to interject too with the advent of things like Glassdoor. Oh yeah. Your culture is is kind of sort of like your laundry on the on the clothesline anymore, right? Like. It can be influenced with social media platforms. You know, if you're looking at a company that you would like to join, you might go to something like Glassdoor and see what are the percentage of people who have put red flags all over it, which is the opposite of what their web, the company's website might be saying, you know, right. obviously. Right. So the data is literally giving you pros and cons to what that, the, the sentiment of, the employees that are there for sure which affects the people that are potentially coming in and also the people who may be doing business with somebody you know i I don't know about you but if i'm looking at a vendor or if i'm looking at somebody who i'm going to you know purchase from i'm going to go and look at some of those reviews um you know wherever wherever those may be yeah and then um and then the internal people too you know it's it can be uh it can be a real motivational boost to see these you know five star reviews and you know i'm so glad i work for this company and yeah. you know all that and i've seen that recently where there's 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 some dynamite uh companies where that that have really focused on culture you know so they have these positive reviews but they also have and, and they have people who espouse those values right they're they're they, they really align with them and then you have the opposite, of course. Rich, can I pick up on that for a minute? Um, the places where you were saying they had a really, really strong culture, really positive, sounded like a positive culture, a really um, good place to work. Are those places also places that are comfortable with change or that are learning organizations? And, and I'm trying to tie it back to our topic of culture of change. Do those organizations yeah. that were getting rated very highly by the workforce right. were those also places that did a good job making change comfortable palatable acceptable exciting um what, yeah what would so, you read on that it, yeah that's a great question and in fact so i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna go to this very specific example i'm not gonna mention the name of the company small privately owned company of consultants right all the consultants are on 1099, which is like, well, you know, okay, so. So that for con- people who aren't familiar with 1099, it basically means it's a group of independent workers who yeah. are not tied in any way to that company for a long term. They're just right. associating themselves for the purpose of one or more contracts, but there's not a permanent um, working agreement there. Exactly. Right. And, and at the same time, they don't have to work. They, they can do the work the way that they see fit, right? It's interesting, though, that this company, they, they, they have kind of worked together to adopt a way that they align with what the company's values are. So people do work in this kind of within this kind of system, right? Um, as a consultancy, 
every every project is different and every one of these workers is doing something different every week so that that kind of richness of we're going to do chain we're going to do training this time we're going to talk, focus on leadership development here we're going to do the analytics work for this particular company or we're going to um uh we're going to onboard you know some other company right so every, there, there are these different projects that are happening and they're they're very happy about the new challenges that are happening so it's it, it's it's literally changed at every step of the way but they're working with a fr- within a framework that is aligned with you know the cultural values here which is to support these um, local small businesses um, across a few different industries like that I think they serve like five different industries um, so it's it's consistent so there is a culture there but everybody is very happy and really saying we love working here it's the best place we've ever worked like literally I was I was getting that from uh, four of the workers that were that were there it's the best place I've ever worked it's not steady like they'll tell me that like it's not the steady work that i'm used to getting but it's really gratifying and and we've been here for 15 years five years nobody's been there for you know less than three so oh, i'm sorry there was one person that was kind of newer but like she really picked up on it and went all in right so um yeah you know, so those those do exist, okay. and and I think that that's the thing. It's it's kind of that learning environment. And, um, yeah, it also sounds like each person gets to do the kinds of projects that they feel passionate about or they, they specialize in, right? Giving that extra layer of agency. Sure. You know what they're, yep. what they're not getting in terms of a uh, steady, uh, you know, infrastructure where they're on the payroll and. You know, they don't have to worry about their taxes and everything's taken care of. What they're getting in exchange for all of that kind of security and uh, predictability is that elevated sense of agency and independence. Right. That's great. Yep. That's great. I will say last time I checked into what was still at the top of those ranges of good cultures that still had a reputation for it. I did see still at the top to your question also, Ben, uh, Google. Apple and Microsoft, right? And these are companies who have built their culture around innovation, right? right? And they are maintaining that without some of the downsides that come with that rapid innovating. For sure. Yeah, one of the one of the um, commonalities that I've read about, and actually, I just I talked to a Googler recently. Yeah. So Googler is somebody who works at Google. Um, uh, he's a, a friend of the friend of a family member. Um, so, uh, Google is all about, uh, ha- helping people to grow, right? So they, there's this skill shop that they have. Um, there's this internal training. They use Udemy to be able to get like certifications and stuff like that. Um, but they also let them, so, so there are specific uh personal goals so there's these kind of growth goals that people set for themselves that's very important and there's a certain level of job crafting that happens where they are able to kind of craft what what they do right that's that's different from everybody else right uh, so that's i, I I, I'm not exactly sure if that's part of the Googliness of uh, of Google, <laughs> but but it, it, that that innovation part is certain. At at one point years ago, and Rich, I'll be curious if your if your friend was reporting similar still today. But years ago, it was it was a pretty big deal that was public that Google's culture allowed each employee to work something pretty high, like ten percent of their time each week on a project that was their own project that wasn't tied to the corporate's dictate of what this person was supposed to be working on. It was 
we're going to give you 10% of your time back to do some whatever you want to do. And hopefully, or in theory, it aligned with Google's broader mission, but it was essentially a, a huge grant of time and presumably resources to do what, what they were in, that person was interested in doing. Sure. Sure. Well, their, their whole thing was, um, it used to, the old, the old model was don't be evil. Now the, the new one is do the right, do the right thing. Is that right? Yeah. Do the right thing. Uh, is their, their thing, but yeah, it's, and it's do the right thing using like, your, how do I put this, uh, your values aligned with the company's values. Ah, you know, uh, uh, so right was, right, right was defined. <laughs> yeah, to some extent. Yeah. But it's still, it's still you, you know, so it's still you going after some of those independent type of things. Sure. Sure. That's really great. Let's let's do this. Let's take a break, and then when we come back, we'll talk about ways that people can try to take some of these ideas and start encouraging their own organizations to embrace some of that change positivity. Are you struggling with high employee turnover, low morale, or poor communication within your team? Do you find it challenging to foster collaboration and trust among your employees? Do you have resistance to some of the recent changes you've made in your business? You're not alone. According to sources such as Forbes and the Society for Human Resources Management, many business owners face these same challenges. They know that success comes from a strong workplace culture, but they don't always know where to start. If this sounds like you, it's time to take action. Our experienced consultants stand ready to work with you to develop customized solutions. Don't wait any longer. Take our quick culture scorecard today and discover where you can improve. Work Balance Consulting, where workplace culture meets success. Visit our website at www.workbalanceconsulting.com scorecard and start your journey toward a better workplace today. Again, visit www.workbalanceconsulting.com slash scorecard. And we're back. So uh, we've been talking about this culture of change. We've brought in a few different examples of things that, you know, companies are doing that are creating that kind of positive culture. Uh, specifically, we we're talking about Google just a second ago, um, and not that they're like necessarily the model that everybody needs to adopt. But uh, one thing that I did want to bring up that I read about their um, their culture is to be comfortable with ambiguity. Yeah, and that was the, one of the phrases we used right at the top of the episode. It's this yeah. idea that that companies that when we are thinking about a culture of change. It's organizations that are comfort, comfort able, comfortable with ambiguity that are a learning organization, things like that. So I, I guess where, where I'm wondering now is where, where do people go to start becoming comfortable with change, to start being better at grappling with change? And I'm wondering if I take it back to some of the stats we were talking about at the beginning of the episode, Please. It seems like there's this avalanche of change happening very constantly across the board. Managers came out and said there's too much change going on. Employees are saying they're overwhelmed with change. It's causing stress. So maybe is the first is the first step to to just recognize that that there's too much change going on and then figure out as employees, as middle managers, as leaders, how do we get people comfortable with that? And is part of that saying maybe we shouldn't be doing so much all at once? Or is it a recognition that to stay current in our industry, we have to do all of these things all at once, but we're going to figure out ways to make it as palatable as possible? Right. And if so, then what are some of those ways that we can help people do that? Right. I've got two things to, to say to that. If you recall 
one of the episodes we talked about different types of managers, right? We know that there's at least five or six levels between the transactional laissez-faire and then the transformational, right? So with that model in mind, I think a great place to start for people is to understand the, the why of the decisions that that type of manager is making, right? And yeah. that transparency to understand why this rapid pace of change is happening. And then that, that gives the, the middle manager, the, any, any employee, the opportunity to make a decision about whether or not they can buy into yeah. that why. And if they can, then they will be more resilient with that pace. And, sure. if, and if they can't, then it may not be the culture for them, you know. So that is yeah. that is one place to start. Find out why so, it's happening. I love that. And then, and then do the inner work with yourself and say, well, this is not change I can buy into. I'm not, I'm not going to make it through the, the white water rapids here, you know. Right. I need a culture that is more in tune with what I can buy into. So that's, yep. that's how I think you start. You really have that's to. That's great. Yeah. 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 The purpose is, is, is a very critical part of that. And, and, it, you know, to that effect, we, that I think it's very consistent with what we've been talking about in many episodes is, you know, the crystal clear, this is what we're doing and the purpose and why we're, we're doing that. Right. Um, at the same time, even when people get that why, right, sometimes there's the, that stress is still there because they're like, they may still be asking, oh, why now? Or why yes. me? Yes. And, <laughs> or, and, and not everyone has the luxury of saying, oh, well, you know, a taste testing, this culture isn't for me. Sometimes you don't have a choice and you just need to buckle in and ride those rapids and hope that you learn something about yourself. you come out stronger, more resilient and hope that the stress doesn't become unmanageable to the point where it starts affecting everything. Right. Most especially your health. Well, and to that effect though, uh, I think, um, I think leading with data Right. So um, eliciting, you know, we, we've talked about communication and the feedback loop, right? But, you know, eliciting feedback and getting the, uh, the, the sentiments of people. What, how are they feeling about this, you know, the, the change and all that stuff? Is there, is there a way that we can adapt to them, get them support and, and all of that, uh, that I think that part can be cultural to support all these different change Fine. initiatives. You know, and I, I know I've been part of, you know, when you change one part of a technology system, you're, especially if it's integrated with something else, you're changing like two or three other parts, right? Like if I, if I'm using Salesforce, I'm also going to be integrating with probably QuickBooks and probably the marketing piece. And so, you know, you have all these different teams that are involved. And so everybody is like, okay, I got to learn this, this, and this, right? So I, to what you were saying, Ben, you know, that that huge amount of people that are like juggling three projects at one time because, and that's just the technology part, right? Um, they're going to get overwhelmed mm -hmm. that, allowing them to, you know, voice their, voice their, um, their frustrations, their feedback, their, you know, what, and then, and then eliciting from them, what can we do to make your job, to raise your job status? Yeah. What are your needs right? to, to make yeah. this work for you? Right. Yeah. Ideally you have that opportunity to have some of those accommodate. There's a level of, of um, empathy there or emotional intelligence was a term that was kicked around a lot you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, this idea, there. what's that? It's still there. Yeah, yeah, it's still there. No, it's it's still there and, mm -hmm. and it's, it's still very relevant. I'm just saying it's not a new concept, uh, but it seems like this idea of 
empathy, emotional intelligence, whether you're a leader by title or a leader by reputation, it seems like having some of that is more critical now than maybe it was many, many years ago. Generally, I'm thinking generationally years ago, where there's a sense that um, you need to be able to get in tune with people that you work with and understand how you can help them be comfortable with change. And I would say that that's, that's a, a skill that I don't think people are trained on very well. At least I haven't seen that become something of a, of a specific course that people can take or a specific degree that people can get. Uh, it seems like at least when I was going through business school, that was touched on in bits and pieces, but it was not a, a core component of what a leader must do. We, we you know, we always think about leaders um, needing to understand how to think strategically or read a financial statement or manage resources or work with vendors or suppliers or customers, things like that, managing relationships. But I would argue that a new skill, if it's not already being taught, that needs to be at that level of top leadership skills is this idea of helping others in your organization be comfortable with change. Sure. That's great. And Ben, I think what you're talking about in part is the job of folks in industrial organizational psychology, right? This is this is the direction that I think human resources needs to move into. It's shifting that idea from being purely business agenda focused into a more people focused agenda, which will in turn increase ideally the profitability and success of the business agenda. Right. So mm -hmm. that kind of, yeah, it sounds way, very much aligned. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that in years past, that idea that you would just, you know, keep your needs and your stressors to yourself, just keep your head down, show up, do your job. You're getting a paycheck after all. Why? make any requests for any accommodation or, you know, and, and that is certainly mm -hmm. shifting. That is certainly changing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah. For sure. For sure. I've noticed in, you know, just you know, the different trainings that I've gone through for certifications and, and what I've read on, on those types of things too. Um, there is a more and more, there is this kind of coaching element. Mm -hmm is put into, you know, um, project management that's put into OD and change leadership that's put into, um, even, even some degree of, you know, Six Sigma, um, and, uh, uh, HR for sure. You know, in fact, I, I, this HR course that I'm teaching right now, that's, that's one of those things that's in there, right. Um, being able to help people to, uh, solve their own issues in some way, right? So you're, you're, you're coaching them by listening to them and then asking and eliciting kind of um, responses from them so that they're they're kind of solving their own problems and coming up with their own solutions. Um, so it's empowering them to make some decisions. Um, I think that that's something that we, we, we've seen in the literature a lot more, um, you know, at least me in the last you know three years that I've been <laughs> that I've been studying you know uh, IO psychology. Right. Well, that's the flip side of comfort with ambiguity, right? We haven't said it yet, not that I recall, but the psychological safety with hmm. failing as you make your own decisions in an environment that is ambiguous, right? Yeah. That's in my opinion. That's leadership meeting you in the middle. If I expect you to be comfortable with ambiguity i also want you to feel safe to fail right how else can you work your way through that murkiness sure sure love it well i think uh what's let's let me, let's put it this way uh to wrap things up what's one thing that you would say that, a, that a, an organization can do. So each one of us, one thing. 
<laughs> that they could do to foster this kind of culture of change. So many. Times. That's a lot of pause. <laughs> I just love that I've gotten you to voluntarily say what's one thing. Uh, 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 as opposed uh, to what are the 97 things? What is the entire framework? 20, yeah. 28 episodes. What is the model? Yeah. 28. I mean, like, those, are, those are all so good, but it's like. For and that's me, just for it. Me, there, there, there's not one. There's not just like one answer. Like there's, there's yeah, a I know. bag of tricks for everything. I, I know. And that's, that's. That's what, what makes that whenever anyone says, what's the one thing you can do to blah, blah, blah. It's, it's like, well, yeah. it's, it's, um, it's a start. It's right. a place to start, but it's never the entirety. Right. right. So you're, you're going to say, there's not just one thing. <laughs> well, if I'm being, if I'm putting on my consultant hat, it depends. But I like what Cheryl said earlier about, and, and what you said earlier, Rich, about clarifying the why. And I would just append that with clarify the why, tell it crisply with very simple, easy to understand language, not jargon, not industry speak, not, not slogany stuff, but just something that your neighbor's mom would understand about the why. And couch that in a dose of, uh, a heavy dose of, of empathy and putting other people's needs ahead of yours. So that's kind of one and a half. Okay. It's a one Y with a delivery vehicle of empathy. How there you that? go. Beautiful. Beautiful. That's great. Beautiful. That's great. And I would say we hadn't talked about this, but in your recruitment and your talent management, these are values that you can start working into even those conversations. Or before on. people come into the environment. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Right. Yeah, for me, uh, you know, I, I, I still like, um, you know, leading with leading with the data, you know, and that's mm. qualitative and quantitative, you know. So, so there's, you know, looking at performance numbers and all that stuff, you know, and and looking at you know what is our culture and and uh, are things you know working within that culture. But then getting the feedback from other people, you know, whether that's you know through 360 uh, performance reviews or if that's you know just you know um, listening to the grapevine, you know, uh, you know whatever whatever it is that we're able to do to get people to feel that they can express themselves and to be part of the the decision making processes, I think that uh, that's going to help to foster that, that, that culture of change personally. Yep. Cool. Fair enough. So that one thing is like already six-ish things. It's everything. Oh, <laughs> it's everything. Well done. <laughs> Good luck, listeners. Yeah, yeah, that's, right that's, on. That's, that's why that's why folks like you uh, are so important. Because it's not just one thing; it's it's a amalgam, and it's important. It's, I love keeping things simple, but the execution is where things start to get a little bit complicated because people are complicated and systems yeah. are complicated. Rich, you, you mentioned it before. Processes right. are complicated, right. so you need help and expertise navigating all that and executing on all that. Yep, people sure. people learn differently. Absolutely. All right. Well, thanks again for joining us, listeners. Uh, as always, as we say, make change your friend. Oh, that was good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I got a big long pause in there. I gotta, I gotta chuck out, but we're good. I love your laugh. I love making Rich truly happy. Thanks for listening to Harmonious Workplaces. 
You can find Harmonious Workplaces on LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, Spotify, Amazon, Apple, and other streaming platforms. We'd love any feedback on whatever channel you find us on. Please rate, like, and share our podcast with your network. And remember to add Harmonious Workplaces to your list of favorites to get notified about each new episode. To contact Rich or Cheryl, please visit www.workbalanceconsulting.com. To connect with Ben, find him on LinkedIn or visit at www.harborsidestrategy.com.